Good afternoon. It's been a long time since I've done any videos on YouTube, and I noticed there's been some comments asking for more cider making videos. So I thought, why not do a, a small video collage of one of my favourite styles of uh, cider making, which is the French style. Uh, they use a process called keeving, and it's how they make their cider in Breton and Normandy. If you don't know much about it, uh, the Breton style of cider is usually served in champagne bottles with corks and cages. It's usually sweet and it's quite low alcohol and it's also quite insipid in the flavour. There's usually not enough acidity in there um, by a British standard. The reason is the keeving process itself. To do keeving, you need to use bittersweet cider apples because you're relying on an enzyme naturally present in the um, juice and the fruit and it becomes denatured if the juice is too acidic. So you can only really use bittersweet cider apples and perhaps with a few sharps blended in. The other thing you need for the keeving process is you need a lot of pectin in the fruit. So you need very, very ripe fruit. So quite often you'll use, say, the later cider apples and you'll make sure they're absolutely so ripe you could drive your thumb through them before you start process to guarantee you've got as much pectin in there as possible. The, the amount of pectin will go up as the fruit gets riper. And the final thing you need is cold. You can obviously artificially chill it, but the historic process would be you'd be making this late in the autumn when it's uh, the temperature in your cider barn is very cold. The reason being is you want the fermentation to start very, very gently to have time for the keeping process to take effect. So the first step is to select which cider apples we want to use in the keeping process. So for the bittersweet, the main constituent I use is Yarlington Mill. Uh, this is Yarlington Mill here. You see there these lovely uh, reddish pink, rather large cider apples. Got a lovely apple aroma to them. They're a mild bittersweet, so there's not much acidity in there, and there's a nice load of tannins. The juice itself is, usually comes out very dark brown from the press, and the cider it makes has a lovely, wonderful, kind of um, rich, orangey colour. And the flavour profile of it is, is fruity. You've got all the fruitiness in there. And it's got a nice drying astringency without any kind of biting uh, tannins in there. So it's a wonderful cider apple itself. And it will be perfect for the key cider we're going to make. As you can see, a lot of the crop has now already fallen naturally. And it's on the floor. For the cider I'm making, this is actually what I intend. If I shake the trees early, the fruit gets bruised and it's more liable to rot quickly. Because what I'm trying to do is get the fruit as ripe as possible for the keeping process. So this has all been allowed to just fall naturally with the wind slowly over time. What I do now is I'll check the fruit and see if it's getting about right. Um, when you look around, you can um, tell at the moment there's very little rotten fruit. Uh, an indication would be when, say, you go down egg and ice about 10% rotten now. It's obviously very ripe and the early drop fruit has gone, so you really need to pick it. I'm smelling the fruit now to see what it smells like. It's got a lovely aroma. It's starting to get a bit softer. It's still quite hard, though, the fruit. It's got a lovely red colour here. And as long as it's sitting on a grass sward like this, not on the mud, and no insects or other animals are getting at it. It's, it's quite happy to sit here in truth. So for this side, what I'm actually doing is leaving as much as possible to fall naturally on the floor and then hand pick from the ground when I think the fruit's about ready. Here's a video collage of some of the apple trees in the orchard that will be used for this year's Keeve. What I'm doing is every few days I'm walking the orchard, looking at the varieties, looking at the fruit on the floor, trying to work out how much has dropped, what's the percentage drop of the tree. If it's over 60% down, then it's probably a good indication that it's time to start thinking about it. Uh, picking it. I'm checking there's no damage of the fruit on the floor from animals. 
And when I think it's uh, perfectly ripe, uh, then I'll be harvesting it for the keeve. There's going to be some shaking involved at the end. Um, you will have to shake the trees a bit. And that's what I'm doing with the Yarlington Mill tree there. So here's all the fruit I'm going to use for the 2022 keeve. As you see, I've picked all the fruit and I'm storing it in these builder sacks. And what I'm doing is I'm keeping the apple variety separate here. Uh, one variety per sack, essentially. The, the reason is apples mature at their own rates. And for keeving, I'm pressing it all together. And I want to make sure I can get the apples as ripe as possible, but without any of them just going over and rotting. And if I picked all the apples and put them in a giant mound, and I'm waiting then for the apples to be ripe, I might miss the fact one of them's just gone too far and it's just rotting away. So by keeping them separate, I can keep an eye on each of the different apple varieties and make sure they're good to go. So this here, say, is Yarlington Mill. And you can probably see, I can drive my thumb into the fruit now. It's incredibly soft, great apple aroma. That, that looks good to go. And I'm storing it in these large uh, mounds and builder sacks is called tumping the cider making community. Historically, we used to get large hessian sacks and you'd pick the fruit and you would put them in the sack and just lean them against the apple trees in the orchard. The reason you store them for longer than just say when you pick them off the floor is just because an apple has fallen off the tree doesn't mean it's ripe. Um, quite often it takes a period of weeks uh, after an apple has fallen for it to be perfectly ripe and good to go. So you always need to store them somewhere. One of the things you need to be careful of when you're tumping fruit and storing it to get it more ripe before pressing is the fruit at the top of the builder's site will be nowhere near as far ahead as the fruit further down. So if you look down here, say, you can see this one's obviously been bruised before and it's starting to rot. And as you look around, you'll probably see some more like this. But as we start shoveling this sack, we'll notice further down, there'll be a lot more like that because it's its own microcosm in these um, tumping piles. And the fruit further down will, uh, it's all respiring. It's, uh, it's technically a live apple, isn't it? They've just started going over and going off quicker near the bottom. And so if you waited until, you know, there's a lot of them on the uh, top start and go a bit brown, you think, oh, that's perfectly right, that's right. You might find as you go down the sack, the stuff near the bottom is just totally gone over and it's unusable. So it's just something to pay attention to when you're tumping. You can see here that's uh, just bruising damage there, but... Uh, all these uh, bruises are a potential uh, point of entry where uh, you know microbes can get in there and just start watching the fruit. So it's just something to be wary of. So these are all the apples we're going to use in our Keeve cider. I'll start on the left with the uh, my left, the uh, bittersweets. This one here is Yarlington Mill, and it's a lovely old mild bittersweet. It's got a nice, deep, rich um, drying tannin in there, and it's got a nice amount of uh, apple flavour going on. It's, it's a lovely apple, that. This one here is a uh, Dabinet. It's a very famous uh, English cider apple variety, and it's the most widely grown, I believe. And that's a uh, medium bittersweet. It's got more tannins than the Arlington Mill, and it's got a deeper stringency with a bit of a bite to it, and its own kind of characteristic flavour. This one here at the end is Ashton Brown Jersey. It's another medium bitter sweet, but it has more of a more apple flavour going on than the Dabnet, and in truth I think it makes a nicer cider. I've got one sweet cider apple variety here, and this is sweet coppin. They're these kind of yellow apples, they've got quite a thin skin and they bruise very easily. The dark marks and all there are just the damage that the uh, fruit's taken by just being knocked around. I've got two eating apple varieties going into the mix, and this is part of the Sharps blend. This one here is Ashmead's Kernel, and you see they have a... Usually they're quite green in colour, but if you get them when they're um, 
got this nice red going on. They get incredibly sweet, and they've got this wonderful pear dropped uh, flavour in there. And it's very aromatic uh, apple. They're absolutely lovely to eat, in truth. This little one here is called Golden Knob, and it's an old Devon eating apple variety. It's got a lovely little uh, honeyed flavour in there, and it used to be sold into London in the Victorian era for use in children's lunch boxes. I've got one cooking apple here, and this is, uh, probably you'll recognise it, this is Bramley Apple Seedling. And the trick with cider making is to wait till they start going a bit yellow before you use them. You still get a bit sweeter then and the acidity will drop down. And I've got two sharp cider apples at the end. And this one here is Chaxil Red, which is quite a rare um, variety and it's got a quite clean, crisp, sharp flavour. And this last one here is another rare variety and this is Black Tom Pup. And they make these lovely, huge, kind of irregular shaped uh, apples. And it's uh, got a nice amount of acidity in there and it does actually have a doesn't really have any tannin, but it does have a nice kind of cider flavour going on. But together, this will be what I'll be using for the Keeve blend. So with the keeving process, you have to mill the fruit and store the milled pomace overnight, then press the day after. So in order to store it, I need some container. So what I've done is I've got three of these IBCs here, and I've just cut the tops off and remove the cages on top and I'll be using these to store the pomace. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the end one there and I'll store all the sharp apple pomace separately and all the bitters and sweets will be in the other two. I'm doing that so I can keep it uh, separately when I press it for the juice so I can end up with a sharp juice and a bittersweet juice and then I'll blend them together to make sure I don't have too much acidity in there which will stop the keeping process. The reason you mill the pomace and leave it overnight is, well there's several reasons. You're, you're breaking down all the cell walls in there, you're releasing the enzymes in there so it's been shown that it can increase the sugar content of the juice because some of the residual starches will be converted to sugars by the amylase enzyme. You're slightly oxidizing it because obviously the top layer on there will be exposed to the oxygen and that will help lower some of the uh, tannins in there and some of them precipitate out. You'll uh, release some of the apple aroma precursor compounds and that might help with the apple aroma. And finally, and most importantly, you're releasing a lot of the pectin from the cells there. And pectin's the vital thing that's needed in the keeving process. As we need ripe fruit for the keeving process, we need to be able to assess when the fruit's ripe enough. So this is a Yarnton Mill here, and I'll just go through the way I check if it's ripe enough for the keeving. First thing I do is smell the fruit. Good apple aroma from that. When fruit becomes uh, very ripe, the aroma will really increase. Underripe fruit doesn't have much aroma. The next thing is to see how soft the fruit is. You can probably see there, I've managed to just drive my thumb in there without much pressure. So the fruit is very soft there. And that's a good uh, indication it's getting ripe. Uh, the next one is how waxy it is. This is quite uh, waxy now. Quite often with apples uh, go to full ripeness, they do have a nice slippy waxy sheen on the um, fruit. We can cut the uh, fruit open now and look at the pips. That's usually a very good tell. Now when apple pips are perfectly ripe, they go uh, a uniform dark brown colour. When they're underripe, they'll be uh, creamy yellow and they'll slowly change uh, to dark brown. So you can see the pips there are all very dark brown in colour, which is a, a good indication. And we can also try the fruit, taste the fruit, see how it tastes. Mmm. Fruit's really soft, it's really, really sweet. A good amount of tannins coming through, an apple aroma. That's a very good indication as well. And this one's a bit uh, unique as well, is you can see there's some pink coloration in there. Uh, certain apple varieties, when they have a lot of sun on them and get very ripe, can um, start getting pink staining in the flesh. And this Yarlington Mill does have a bit in it, and that's a good indication it's ripe as well. 
So I personally say this is perfectly ripe and good to press. So this is a video collage of washing and milling the fruit outside my barn. What I'm doing first is I'm shoveling the fruit into these grey plastic crates and then I'm washing them in an IBC with the top cut off. Rotten fruit, as you can see there, I'm discarding as I go through. And I'm going to ensure all the fruit is nicely washed, nice and clean, and all rotten fruit is got rid of at this step. After it's been washed, I'm then putting it through that silver trumpet mill and milling it into plaster as bucket. And once the buckets are full, they're then carried in and put into the IBCs in the barn. So all the pomace has been milled now and it's been left overnight. So, as I said previously, the one in the far corner there is all the sharp apples, and these two are bittersweets here. And it took uh, 15 plasterers buckets on top of that to actually uh, mill everything yesterday. But it's all been left overnight, and today we'll press it for our keep. So now we're going to press the cider here. It's nothing special, this is a standard rack and cloth press. So we're just going to start with a bit of sweet fruit and just slowly work our way through pressing it all. When the fruit's very ripe, especially eating and cooking apples, uh, there's a chance it can start gumming up the um, pores in the cloth and make uh, juice extraction very difficult. Um, the Arlington Mill this year you knows the cider apple is having that issue. Traditional cider apple varieties, a lot of them have what the cider makes me describe as a woolly texture. It's hard to really describe, but the texture of the flesh is such that it makes pressing very easy. You get a very uh, clean juice extraction. But uh, some varieties like Yarlington Mill, and especially eating and cooking apples, but not selected for woolly texture, can be quite difficult to press, especially ripe. And peri pears are notorious for it as well. And if you start having issues um, pressing the fruit, uh, well, these are things you could try. You could try changing to a cloth that has a final coarser grade um, hole size in there, see if that helps you. You can try not overloading the layers, and I'm only putting the layers just to the top of the mould, which usually I pile quite a bit more in, and that's because a, a thinner layer has less distance for the juice to travel to escape, so that should uh, help with the pressing a bit. Other things you could try is if you do have more pulp of an easy to press cider apple variety with woolly texture, you could try combining that pomace in with the difficult to press pomace from, say, your eaters, and that would help a bit. One thing you could do is, uh, I know several cider makers who have multiple presses and they'll have a separate press just for peri pairs because they're so hard to press. And Pico Press is a good choice for that. They have a, they're like a stainless steel perforated drum and they have a, a big rubber bladder inside that you inflate with water pressure. And that then presses against the outside drum and pomices between and juice comes out. And they're quite low pressure presses. So they're quite good for dealing with difficult uh, to press things. Uh, with this press here, what I'll do is I'll drive the press up and if it looks like it's starting to shoot pulp everywhere, I'll stop the press and allow the juice to slowly drain away and press a bit more. So I'm pressing slowly and over a long period of time under a lower pressure to give time for the uh, juice to leave the uh, cloths. So what's happening is all the pores are jammed up, the pressure in the cloth is shooting up until all of a sudden it ruptures and just drives out the blocking pulp and everything else through the pores in the cloth and that's why it's shooting like a water pistol uh, upon us everywhere. So once we've pressed the juice in the bran, we're bringing it out here and putting it in these IBCs. On the top here, I've basically got a bucket with um, a bulkhead fitting in the bottom, and I've got here um, 
a grape um, cloth essentially for making homemade wine or whatever. The reason being is you'll still get some amount of uh, sediment coming off the uh, press and I want to capture it before it actually goes in the juice. You see here, this is um, all the pectins and all the um, small bits of apple that have actually gone through the press cloths. And I'm just trapping them here to stop them going into the uh, juice. And as it's quite wet today, I'm just putting a bucket over the top just to stop the rain going in. So all the pomace has now been pressed, and this is the resultant juice here. These two IBCs are the bittersweet juice, and this one on the end here is the sharps juice. As the apples were stored separately and milled separately, and essentially pressed separately, uh, the juice might not be that homogenous in there. So what I'll do next is I'll stir each of the IBCs to ensure the juice is homogenous in there. And I'm going to put two IBCs in the barn and I'm going to pump half of that container into each of them and half of that because the juice in there is probably different to there. That one's probably got more Yarlington Mill in it and this one's got more dab in it. So at this stage I want to have a very homogenous bittersweet juice and homogenous sharps juice and then I'll use that for the blending based on pH. We've pumped across the bittersweet juice and mixed it up thoroughly now and in total we've got about 1,080 litres of bittersweet juice and we've got about 400 litres of sharps juice. So the next thing is um, record keeping. I'll take the specific gravity and the pH of this bitter juice and the sharps and uh, record them just for my own records basically. I've taken the readings now, the specific gravity and the pH and for the curious I'll display them on the screen. The next step is blending the sharps juice in with the bittersweets. With the keeving process, the pH can't be below or more acidic than 3.6, else the enzyme won't work. And with cider making, if the pH is higher than 3.8, that's the danger zone, we've got more chance of bacterial infections. So what I'm trying to do is use the sharps juice and lower the pH as low as I'm able to without inhibiting the enzyme. So I'm aiming for about pH 3.7. Because you're making a sweet uh, side, you do need acidity to balance it flavour-wise. So I know some traditional keep ciders are just made with only the bittersweet fruit, but I always find they taste a bit too insipid, which is why I'm doing this extra step of trying out the sharps. To adjust the juice, what I've done is I've, take, I've measured accurately a litre of the bittersweet juice in here, and I've got a litre here of the sharps juice. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add 100 ml at a time stir the bittersweet juice in there and test the pH. And when it's uh, 3.7, I'll be able to work out how much sharps juice I would need to add to both of these. Okay, from looking at that, the pH is now 3.73, which is fine. And from looking at this, we have to add 400 mils of the sharps juice to the litre of the bitters. So I'll now be able to work out how much sharps juice I would need to raise this and see whether or not I've got enough room in the IBC or else I'll have to pump back and forth a bit to do the mix. So it's the next day now, and I finished the blending and racking of the cider off late last night off camera. And there were three steps I didn't show, which I'll talk about now. Uh, the first step you obviously saw when I blended up the cider and tried to adjust the acidity by blending in the sharps. I've ended up with two IBCs here of roughly 600 litres of juice, and the pH is, say, 3.76, I believe, mean, which is all nice. It's about right, I'd like it a bit sharper than that, but it's a bit will do. And 
I ended up with 300 litres of uh, more base juice at like pH 3.86 in the two containers you'll see in the photograph. Um, so that's the main thing that you I'm not happy with the pH of those, so I'm going to go down the orchard uh, tomorrow and just pick some late brownies and uh, Ashley's kernel that will drop from the top of the trees because I said to all I can't shake the tops. And I'll just quickly um, mill and press that and use that to slightly acidify that juice for me. The next thing I did after I got the juice ready last night was I added the keeping enzyme to it. So this small vial here contains the keeping enzyme and it's a very concentrated solution and in fact I only needed 9 mil of that evenly distributed throughout this IVC. So the way I did that is a cereal dilution. I filled this jug with juice from the IVC. I used this pipette here to accurately draw out the 9 mil of enzyme. I added it to the jug. I then very, very thoroughly stirred the enzyme into that juice so it's evenly distributed and then re-added that juice from the jug into the IVC and then thoroughly stirred it again. By doing a cereal dilution here, I ensured that the enzyme is very well distributed throughout the juice so it can do its work. And the last piece of the puzzle is chilling the juice. When I took temperature of the juice yesterday, it was 11.7 degrees, and it needs to be below 10 degrees Celsius for the cooling process. So these jackets on here are insulating jackets. This one here are, is a washable uh, insulated IBC jacket I bought several years ago. Um, I have only got one, need two. So this one here is quickly made out of that uh, bubble wrap foil back insulation you can buy in being here with copious amounts of duct tape. It doesn't matter how you do it, but you just need some way of insulating the IBC. And then I've got a chill coil going down into it and pumping cold water through it. So this is the chill coil here. So you see me lifting it out here. I made this myself. It's six meters of stainless steel tubing, uh, three eighths of an inch diameter, which is 9.54 millimeters. And I've bent it into multiple loops using a pipe bender and just brought it through an IBC cap. And all I'm doing is just pumping cold water through that um, coil and it's acting like a heat exchanger and chilling down the juice in the IBC. To generate the cold water and circulate it through the system, I'm using this second-hand pub cellar chiller. It's essentially a large insulated box with a reservoir of water in there, kept at just above freezing temperature. And in the centre of it here, there's a pump that's used in practice to recirculate cold water and say a bundle of um, beer lines going up to the bar so to ensure the product's always kept cold all the way up to the serving fonts and I'm using that to just pump the cold water through the system. It's been 24 hours since I added the enzyme so I now need to add the calcium chloride salt to each of the containers of juice and thoroughly mix it in. Once I've gone and mixed the calcium chloride into all the containers, and restarted the chiller, what we've got to do then is wait. It, it may take one to two weeks for the keeping process to start, 
And what will happen is you'll get this gel matrix forming in there that will trap the yeast. And as the yeast gently starts uh, fermenting at the low temperature that will be in here, it, the shepherd brum will rise to the top as a thick gel. So the apples were pressed for the keeve on Friday, and it's now the following Tuesday. What happens at this point of the uh, process is every couple of days I check on the keeve ciders to see how they're proceeding. Um, to see if the chapeau brun, the, the brown cap, is rising and um, whether or not it's time to rack off the juice. If you look here, you can see there's this darker colour at the um, bottom and then there's this lighter colour here. The lighter colour is the gelatinous pectin mass that's been rising to the uh, top. It's unseasonably warm at the moment and it's about 14 degrees in the barn. With the larger IBCs, as I'm chilling them, that's not an issue, but anything over 10 degrees is considered really too warm for keeving because the fermentation will start too quickly. And you can see it, it is already going quite strongly here. I don't think it's ready for racking yet, but I think on Friday I'll have to rack this off now by the look of it. What I'm looking for at this stage is what they call slitting on the top of the um, chapeau brum. That's uh, where you start seeing breaks in it and you see bubbles of fermentation to indicate it started to ferment with some vigour and that's the point to take it off. At the moment the chapeau brum here is still quite wet, there's a lot of moisture in there and what I want it to do is to compact down some more and dry out some more before I take it off. So I'll leave it another few days. It's, it's certainly come on a lot. Yesterday it was only slightly above the surface and it was very, very wet. And today it's dried out and it's risen a bit, bit further. And it's starting to come back down, but I would imagine that, that amount there will half. I'll just show you a quick clip with the lights off with a light behind so you can kind of see what the juice is like below. The juice below the chapeau brun and the keeve cider should be um, very clear if you've got it right. Um, unlike, say, a normal English cider where uh, at the start of fermentation it may be a very murky juice. With the keeve cider, you expect the juice below the cap, if it's working correctly, to be very clear. I'll also show you a brief still now of the IBCs of juice there, a uh, photograph. Uh, down in the cap at the top. As you can see, there's some kind of swirls and discoloration in the juice where the pectin precipitate's forming, but nothing's risen to the surface yet because the juice is being cooled and it's moving at a, a slower rate, which, which is nice. I'll check on it every few days now, and when I think the, um, the chapeau runs right and it's getting nice and compact and dry at the top and there's some slitting in there with bubbles of fermentation through I'll just rack off all the insiders off the um, pectin precipitate. It's now Friday and I'm going to rack these two containers here of the keeve, the remainder that hasn't been chilled down. As you'll see now I've taken some photographs of the side of the container and you'll see that the keeve layer is compacting down as it's drying out and forming a tight mass on the top. If you now see the photos from the top of the container, uh, you'll, you'll see it starts looking a bit drier at the end. And although there's no slitting, on the final photo, there is a lot of bubbles around the edge. You can see it's now fermenting quite vigorously and we really need to take it off the keeve before it starts breaking down the cap. The, the problem with these is because I'm not chilling them, the temperature is still unseasonably warm. It's about 14 degrees, so it's romping away. If you look at the small number of photos I'll show now, uh, from the top of the IBC where it's chilled down, you can see it's progressing a lot more slowly. In the first photo, there's a bit of wispiness on the top in, in the juice. You can see there's some kind of precipitate forming. And then as you go through the series, you can see 
the gel is starting to form there and it's starting to rise to the top but it's yet to actually form a solid chapeau brand. To rack the product off the keeve I'm using a length of clear perspex tubing here just inserted into my pipework and I'm going to suck it out with a pump. I'll breach the uh, chapeau brun here, I'll insert the tube just below it and draw it through. By using a clear perspex tube, I'll be able to easily see the liquid coming up so I'll know if I'm accidentally um, setting up sediment if I'm too high or low and I can adjust the tube as needs be. So the remainder of the keeve juice has now been wrapped off the chapeau brun. After the racking, we were left with 240 litres of juice. Before the keeving process, there were 300 litres. So we've lost about 20% of the juice, which is, in truth, the ballpark for keeving. They say you lose about 20%. In this cylinder here is some of that juice. We can see it's fairly clear. There is a bit of a haze to it, which is slightly disappointing. I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't drop another uh, Chapeau Brun deposit and we have to rack it again in a, a week or so. If we look at the specific gravity, it's 1.051. So there has been a bit of fermentation as it started at 1.0545. What I'll do with the juice now is I'll keep an eye on it. If I have to, I'll rack it again to slow the fermentation down further and remove any uh, other Chapeau Brun deposits have dropped. And when I finish the main keeve in the IBCs in the back of this shot, this juice will then be used to top them both up. It's the 16th of November today and it's been 12 days since I pressed the juice for this keeve. As you've seen in the previous videos, I've been chilling these two IBCs down with these chill coils here. And in, in truth, it's still been very warm uh, this November. It's only today, in fact, dropped below 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, the rest of the time, it's been quite a bit warmer. And the chill setup I've got doesn't chill it that much, so the key has progressed fairly rapidly anyway. I'll just now cut to a video of the side of the IBC and you can see the Chapeau Brun gel mass at the top and below it you see there's quite a clear juice. As with the remainder I've already racked off, I'll use my clear perspex tube to pierce the Chapeau Brun and I'll rack off all the clear juice below into separate IBCs and then we'll discard the Chapeau Brun and then we'll top up both the IBCs with the remainder juice from the other day. You can see how nice and clear the juice is there. And unfortunately, you see every so often some sediment is going up through the tube. So there's obviously still some bits of pectin mass in the juice, which is unfortunate. The keeve juice has now been racked across into these two IBCs and they've been topped up with the remainder keeve juice. In total, we've got about 1,200 litres of juice here, and if you recall, we had 1,500 litres at the start. So we've lost about 20% of the juice in the keeping process. The next part of it is just a standard fermentation. We're going to allow the cider to just ferment in these IBCs, and every few days we'll check the specific gravity. And when there's been a 10 degree drop in gravity, we'll do the first racking. That will be where we transfer the cider from one IBC to a new one, leaving the yeast sediment at the bottom. Doing that will help slow the fermentation down further because the aim of the process is we want the yeast to run out of nutrients and it to uh, naturally finish fermenting with residual sugar in there. So every few days now we'll take specific gravity and at 10 degree drop we'll do the first racking. As the temperature is now finally below 10 degrees Celsius, I won't chill these down to do the racking. But if, if it was still unseasonably warm, or say you're fermenting in a part of the world which is 
quite warm naturally, say, you know, the, the mid teens Celsius or above. I would recommend chilling the cider down for a week before the racking, just so the yeast stops fermenting and drops to the bottom before you do the racking, as that will aid in slowing the fermentation.